اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ الذي جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولیمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ الذي هدانا لہذا وما کننا لنہتدی لولا ان هدانا اللہ ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد محمد وعال محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that He gives us these opportunities where we gather in glorification and remembrance of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Al-Hujjah, Jalallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. And to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the wafat of the one who raised and sheltered our beloved Prophet, Hazrat Abu Talib, alayhima afzalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There are many lessons that we can take from the life of Hazrat Abu Talib, alayhi salam. You know, when we try and study an individual to try to see how we can emulate that individual, um, the position of Hazrat Abu Talib is not in question with us. You know, if we were having this discussion with others um, of different um, faith, for example, or different sects within Islam, then maybe the question about the faith of Hazrat Abu Talib would be, would be a dialogue or a place for discussion. But we are um, those who recognize the position and the maqam of Abu Talib alayhi salam from what he did from the childhood of the Prophet until the time that Abu Talib salam left this world, we know how much the Prophet honored him, how much the Prophet respected him. I mean, this is why he is famously known as uh, Mu'minul Quraysh, the, the Mu'min of Quraysh, the believer uh, of the Quraysh. And so when we look at his life, I think there are many avenues that we can take and that we can learn from. Uh, the most glaring, I think, you know, and the most obvious as well, probably, would be the way that he sheltered the Prophet and, and took care of him. Um, and, and the lesson that we can take from that is the importance um, that we all have to look after orphans, right? To, to make sure that we take whatever steps necessary um, to either shelter, comfort, financially support orphans. But, you know, it's not just that Abu Talib, alayhi salam, um, raised an orphan, right? Because the Prophet was an orphan. You know, it's really amazing, isn't it, that I was reflecting about this today. Um, the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, and I don't think it's us, but many of us um, are guilty or we're, we get blamed for forgetting about the Prophet and concentrating on the Imams only, right? Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily true, but we could do a better job of remembering the Prophet more often. Uh, none of the Imams were orphans. As such, you know, except maybe the ninth and the tenth Imams, because their 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 fathers were, um, sorry, yeah, the ninth and the tenth Imams who became Imams at a very young age. Uh, but when you look at the Prophet, the Prophet was an orphan from both sides, a mother and a father, you know. Um, and I don't think we have that in any of our Imams. That even when the Imams' parents were or their fathers were 
uh, made into shaheed or shuhada, uh, their mother was still around. But the Prophet had a very unique circumstance. He was an orphan. Um, and what's amazing is that Abu Talib alayhi salam, obviously his grandfather Abdul Muttalib took the responsibility of raising him. We all know this. And then at the age of eight, um, he, he left this world and, and Hazrat Abu Talib took over the sheltering of the Prophet. And the way he sheltered him, you know, I think that's what's amazing here is that I can only speak for myself. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but what I can speak for myself is that up to now, I have not come across a riwayah in which the Prophet talks about how much he missed his father and mother. Yeah. Now that's amazing, you know, because what's closer to an individual than their father and their mother, and especially for an orphan, right? To say that, Kash, I had more time with my father. Kash, I had more time with my mother. But I, I haven't come across this. Now, I'm not saying that it's not existing. Um, but the fact that he doesn't mention that, or at least I haven't seen him mention that, it points to the brilliance of the way Abu Talib raised him. Yeah? It points to the fact that how Abu Talib nurtured him and looked after him and sheltered him to that extent where he filled all the void that was there in the Prophet's life. And that's what's amazing about Abu Talib. Yeah? That when we say that we need to look after orphans, you know, it's really easy for me here just to go to alain.org and, and give $50 and say, I've looked after an orphan. Well, that's one thing, right? But actually to, to nurture an orphan, to shelter an orphan, to look after an orphan, right? Um, that's, I think, a very brilliant lesson that we can take from the life of Abu Talib alayhi salam and something that we all um, can strive towards and definitely do uh, a better job with. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammadim. Allahumma salli ala wa ali Muhammad. You know, history tells us that Abu Talib alayhi salam was always aware of the status of the Prophet. Um, that it wasn't that after Risala that Abu Talib said, Oh, subhanallah, you are now the messenger of God, right? Um, but the status of, Abu, of, of the Prophet was always known to Abu Talib alayhi salam. And of course, you know, one of the most famous accounts that we have is regarding the expedition in which Abu Talib went with his caravan of goods and, uh, and the Prophet had accompanied him. Some say there was eight, some say that he was 12 at that time. Um, and then they passed by a particular area where there was a monk by the name of, what's his name? Bahira, yeah? Where this monk, a Christian monk, saw something unique transpiring around this young boy. And so he called um, this young boy towards him and he recognized, he says, I am fluent in the Torah and I am fluent in the Injil. And this is that person that has been described both in the Torah and the Injil who will come to be the Savior. And he asked who was accompanying him and Abu Talib said, I am. And that's when Bahira tells him about um, the great person that he will become. Uh, this is a very famous story, right? I think we've all heard this story before. And I'm not denying the authenticity of the story. I don't have the, 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 the ability to do that. But let's just say that that story was true, right? This monk saying this to Abu Talib alayhi salam was not for Abu Talib. It was for us. So later on in history, we would know that people knew the status of the Prophet. Because what we have in our books is that Abu Talib recognized the status of the Prophet from the time the Prophet was an infant. Yeah? From the time the Prophet was still a suckling baby, Abu Talib knew that this was not an ordinary human being. Rather, he was been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are very famous incidents around this. You know, the most famous of them, that once um, there was a major drought in Makkah. Um, and no one um, knew how they would survive. And at this time, Abu Talib, who was always the, the leader of the Quraysh after Abdul Muttalib, um, he called for the Prophet, yeah? and it is said the Prophet at this time was still a suckling baby. Yeah? He was still an, an infant at this time, and he, he cradled or he carried the Prophet, and he went towards the Kaaba, and he stood by the Kaaba and held on to the Kaaba, 
And he said, O Lord, by the sake of this child, send rain upon this land. And it is said, as soon as he finished this dua, clouds assembled and rain began to fall in Makkah. Yeah? Imagine, right? There are many amazing aspects of this story, but I think that for, for the person that we're here to honor um, is the fact that he recognized the status of the Prophet, right? It wasn't that... And the reason I mentioned that story of the monk, because it's a very popular story. But it, it, in many ways, if we were to understand it from a different lens, it is there to diminish the status of Abu Talib. Yeah? That he didn't know what he had in his hand until someone else reminded him he had a gem in his hand. No, he didn't need someone else to remind him he had a gem in his hand. Abu Talib knew he had a gem in his hand. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah? So here we see that lovely status that Abu Talib, you know, Abu Talib is known for his poetry. There are books written about Diwan of Abu Talib, the poetry of Abu Talib. And he, he writes down a poem regarding this event when he held the Prophet and rain came down. Um, and he says, وَأَبْيَضُ يُسْتَسْقَى الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ وَأَبْيَضُ يُسْتَسْقَى الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ ثِمَالُ الْيَتَامَى إِسْمَةٌ لِلْأَرَامِلِ He says, he is a luminous-faced one, and it is for him that clouds pour down rain. Yeah? Look at how he recognized the status of the Prophet. He says, it is because of him that clouds gather and rain begins to fall, for he is the shelter of the orphans and the protector of the widows. Yeah? This is a baby. The Prophet is a baby at this time. Yet, Abu Talib is able to foretell that this is not going to be an ordinary individual. He says, those from the Banu Hashim, يَلُوذُ بِهِ الْهُلَّاكُ مِنْ آلِ هَاشِمٍ فَهُمْ إِنْدَهُ فِي نِعْمَةٍ وَفَوَادِلٍ He says that those from the Banu Hashim who face destruction seek refuge in him. And it is by means of him that they find themselves receiving bounties and favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they all recognized, right? He recognized that it was the Prophet who was bringing barakah to the Quraysh and to the Banu Hashim. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So the question is like, how did he know? Right? That, that would be the next question. Like, okay... I've said that, how, that he knew from the time that he was a child. Well, it's not me saying history is telling us. History is proving to us that he recognized. And how did he know? And our ulama give an answer to this question. Obviously, they derived this answer um, from traditions. Uh, but we get a very beautiful statement by Allama Majlisi. Allama Majlisi is Sahibul um, Bihar, right? Biharul Anwar, the, uh, the voluminous book over 110 volumes of hadith that were um, um, gathered by Allama Majlisi. Allama Majlisi, he says, Wa amma, he says in Bihar, volume 17, page 142, he's talking about the status of Abu Talib. He says, Wa amma Abu Talib, fa innahu kana min awsiyai Ibrahim wa Ismail alayhim as salam. وَكَانَ حَافِذًا لِكُتُبِهِمْ وَسَيَاهِمْ He says, as far as Abu Talib is concerned, he says, he is the repository or the trust of Ibrahim and Ismail. Yeah? And he is the one who inherited their knowledge and inherited their will. Yani the wasaya and the knowledge that they had, he inherited them. He's not saying that he is a prophet of God. Yeah? He's not saying that, but what he is saying is that he is the inheritor of prophets. And as the inheritor of prophets, he has been given certain insights to be that bridge that takes us to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa This is not blasphemous at all, right? Um, for today, we consider our ulama to be the inheritors of the prophet. We give them this status. They are the inheritors of the Prophet. They are the ones who are there to guide us. If we can accept that our ulama today are the inheritors of the Prophet, then it's not difficult at all to believe that Hazrat Abu Talib salam, was the inheritor of the Prophets. And that's been given this very special status to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we analyze his life and when we look at his life, you will find that throughout it, um, 
there is this constant connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Constant. Yeah? There is this constant uh, communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, from the poems of Abu Talib to the fact that if we go and read um, it was Abu Talib who performed the marriage of the Prophet to Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam and if you read that khutbah you will find him and his status and how he believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he venerated God um, from the way Abu Talib alayhi salam advised the Banu Hashim um, at his own death um, and through all of these different channels or avenues that have reached us about Abu Talib what you find is that Abu Talib alayhi salam was one who was in constant communication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah? um, and it's from this lesson that I want to um, come back to the topic that we are we have been discussing preparing for the month of Ramadan and that is the etiquette of dua how to be in constant communication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we take this great lesson from Abu Talib alayhi salam yesterday we answered certain doubts that we have and again like I said um, these are doubts um, as uh, I believe as Ayatollah Nasir Makaram Shirazi puts it that these are doubts by Juhala right but he's not talking about I think we addressed this two three mudlises ago he's not talking about those who are ignorant in the fact that they are ignorant Right? It's simply that they are ignorant because they haven't understood the value of dua. Doesn't mean that they are juhala like the time of the Prophet and before that. Right? It simply it could be any one of us who don't understand. So we pose a doubt. There is no, there's no issue um, with posing questions. Um, we live in different times now. Right? Um, I'm told there was a time where posing questions was not allowed. In our, in, our, in our culture and in our community, the Baba, this is the way it is, accept it, you know. Um, I, always, I always hear this from our brothers, you know, that uh, whether it was in Kashmir or in different areas, uh, Hyderabad, uh, they say that, you know, we would avoid ulama. Yeah? We would see an alim and we would actually walk away from them because they had this aura of don't come and talk to me, kind of, just listen to what I have to say. Um, we, then we, we change times now, right? Now uh, everything is questioned and, and I think that that's okay. Um, if we're going to question, I don't mind the questioning. But then when an answer is given, accept the answer. Because yeah? if you're questioning, you don't know. If someone gives you an answer, whether you like it or not, that's the answer. Especially if you ask someone uh, you trust, right? To give you an answer, even if that answer doesn't, isn't satisfactory, for you, it will eventually make sense to you because maturity will kick in uh, later on in life. So some of the questions that we said that dua renders one to not put in the effort, right? Like I said, like we said yesterday, um, I ask God for sustenance and then I don't go out and put in a good day's effort and I say, God, where is my sustenance, right? Um, and we answered that. Um, and then we said that dua interferes into the domain of God. We believe that God... Um, has the, our best interest in mind. So if he has our best interest in mind, then why am I even asking him for something else? He should already give me whatever is good for me. So what's the point of dua? And we answered that yesterday. But again, good questions, right? So go back and listen to the answers from yesterday. Um, and the third question that we asked was, dua shows God um, that we are not satisfied with what he's already giving us. Yeah, and you know, like, I want more. Give me more. Allah, give me more. Um, like we recited, we did this tafsir of this Rajab Dua, right, a few weeks ago, uh, where we say, Wa a'atini bi mas'alati iyaka jami'a khayri dunya wa jami'a khayri al-akhir. Yeah, and you know what jami'a khayri dunya and jami'a khayri al means? Everything. Everything, right? And then not only do I ask God for everything, I say, Fazidni min fadlika. And increase for me on top of that. Yani, what else do you want? Yeah? But that's, that's how it is, right? Because in my mind, everything is, is everything. But that's, that's nothing for God. Yeah? It's like a drop. Or nothing. Less than a drop. And so I say, Zidni min fadlika. So give me more, right? Um, so that's the next doubt. That it shows God that we're not satisfied. But again, we answered this doubt yesterday. So now I want to move on. Um, from these three doubts, we were able to create some very important etiquette. If you paid attention, 
we have been taught then that we need to work hard, we need to increase our capacity so that God consistently and constantly um, gives me more and that dua is not about asking only, it's about building a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, um, And so we are told to constantly be in dua. From these three doubts alone, we have learned tremendous etiquette on how to ask Allah and how to be in communication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We come now to a, a next section. And that is uh, a very important question. Right, um, And I think this is a question that many of us... Um, the thought has passed through our mind, but maybe we haven't been courageous enough to verbalize it. And that is that how come sometimes my du'as are not answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah? Like when my baby is like screaming at night, I'm like, Ya Allah, make her sleep. And then she doesn't sleep. And I'm like, Ya Allah, what's up? I prayed to you, why isn't she sleeping? Right? Um, I've been praying to, to get this and it's not happening. I've been praying to get that and it's not happening. Um, and sometimes, I'm not saying it's there all the time, but sometimes you'll be like, man, why is this dua not being answered? There's actually answers to this question, right? Um, we're not the only ones who have thought about this question. People came to the imams and posed similar questions. And so we learn from what the imams say. This hadith um, is about a man who comes to our sixth imam as Sadiq, alayhi salam. Allah. Allah. Muhammad Ali Muhammad and he says there are there are two verses of the Quran that I don't really understand we're only going to talk about the first one but one day we'll talk about the second one um, but the first one the Imam says what are what is what are these verses so he said the first verse is Allah says Udu'uni astajib lakum. ask me call out to me and I will answer you and he guaranteed you call me and I will answer you. So the man says, فَنَدْعُوهُ فَمَا نَرَى إِجَابَتُهُ yeah? He says, we keep calling him, but we are not getting answers from him. Yeah? Why are we not getting answers from him? قَالَ The Imam replies back, right? أَفَتَرَ اللَّهَ أَخْلَفَ وَعْدَهُ He says, do you think God will go back on his promises? So he says, no. Right? So right away, the Iman check is there. Yeah? Do you think God will lie? No. Okay, so you're not doubting from the perspective of Iman. Now you have other doubts that are clouding your Iman. So he says, no, I don't think so. He says, قَالْ أُخْبِرُكَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ He says, so let me explain to you why it is. He says, مَنْ أَطَاءَ اللَّهَ فِيمَا أَمَرَ he says, one who obeys God in that which God has commanded. Yeah? So right away here, like we fall off. Yeah? Because God has commanded a lot from us. Yeah? And I have to be really honest, like am I fulfilling what God has commanded? Right? And if I'm not fulfilling what God has commanded, immediately that's a sign that my du'as are either going, not going to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Or they're going to be delayed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I can't, like it not logically makes sense that I will sin and then I'll expect it from God. It doesn't make sense. God will still provide because as we said in the same dua, right? That you are the one who provides to the one who asks and the one who doesn't ask you. And the one who doesn't even know you. So if God's going to provide to one who doesn't even know him, Obviously, he's providing to everybody. So there are things that everybody will get. But there are going to be certain du'as which will not be granted. Why? Because I don't have the capacity to receive them. The reason I don't have a capacity to receive them is because I have my own weaknesses that I have to deal with first. Right? This can't be like, like breaking news to anybody. Yeah, it can't. It's, it's wild. It's clear. Right? That how can I be a sinner then expect all my du'as to be accepted by God? It doesn't work like that, right? Um, we wouldn't do that with our own children. My child misbehaves, khalas, no pocket money for a week. Yeah? But with God, we'd be like, come on, where's my pocket money? Right? So the first thing that Imam alayhi salam says, that man amara, man ata Allah fi ma amar. The one who obeys God in that which he has ordered. He says, and then after you have done what God has ordered, and then if you ask God properly, God will answer you. Yeah? So the question the man asks is what? What do you think the question the man asks is? 
how do you properly ask God? Yeah? That's the issue, right? How do we properly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And here where the Imam gives an overarching rule, an overarching principle that um, opens the doors to receive God's mercy. Now remember, it's coupled with action, right? Don't forget the action part. Um, not just the words, but the action. Man ata Allah fima amara. One who obeys God in that which He has commanded, and then they ask God properly. How do we ask properly? The Imam alayhi salam says, "Tabda'u, fatahmadu fataham, Allah wa tumajiduhu bi zikri ni'amihi alayka fatashkuruhu." Yeah? He says the first thing to ask God properly is to first and foremost praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Praise God Almighty, then remember Him and thank Him for His blessings He has already provided for you. Yeah? Think about that, right? Like zidni, 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 we say to God, give me, give me, give me. But I haven't shown zero appreciation for what He has already given me. Right? Um, None of us, like if somebody comes up to you, right? Like even our child, my child comes up to me, um, Baba, I want this. I'll be like, slow you down, slow down. Yeah, what do you mean you want this? Yeah? Baba, can I please have this? I really appreciate that you got it for me last time. None of us, our child we wouldn't give. Yeah? Let alone somebody else who just comes to me and, and, and demands something from me. Right? That's the way we turn to God. Yeah, ya Allah, I want this. And Ya Allah, I want that. But first be appreciative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Appreciate what God has given us already. There is an unli unending list of bounties. In ta'uddu ni'mat Allahi la tuhsuha, God says. That if you were to enumerate what I have already provided you, you would not be able to count them, God says. You would not be able to count them, right? The least we could do is show appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has provided. You know, in this world, like, that would be like buttering up somebody. You know what I mean? Like, Baba, I know how, I know how much you do for me. Yeah? And in this world, it would seem like, oh my God, this guy wants something else. But the one who deserves that buttering is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? The one who deserves that type of praise is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Because there is this constant flow from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We have to be appreciative of this right? You look at any of the du'as that the imams have taught us They always begin with sana and hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah? Always Why? Because that's showing your appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And then the imam alayhi salam says Thumma yeah? To salli ala nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam La li ala Muhammad wa ali He says and then you send salawat upon the Prophet and his family Thumma tazkuru zunubaka Tastaghfiru minha And then he says then you recall the sins that you have committed yeah? And ask Allah to forgive you of those sins he says, then you ask whatever you want because now you have asked him properly. Yeah? This is an etiquette of dua, right? Um, that if I want something from God, it just can't be like, God, 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 give me this, give me that. Yeah? In whatever language we do it in. Right? Yeah, I mean, sajda. Like we have to show, ask ourselves, we got to be really honest, right? We're trying to master dua to the best of our ability so that when the month of Ramadan comes, man, I'm running towards God. I'm not stumbling, right? But when I, like when I do sajda to God, right? When I do sajda to shukr to God, and what am I saying? Alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. What is that? That's not even Arabic. Yeah? Really like, what is that, right? Shukranillah, 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 shukranillah. That we, 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 like we are in a race against time or something like that, right? How is that in any way showing appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah? And I honestly, like I'm advising myself before I'm advising any of you here, right? That, again, like I give the example of a child, right? Like if they just come, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and they run away. You're like, what do you mean? Stole down, yeah? Thank me properly, right? And that's the way we talk to them. This is God who does everything for us. 
there has to be etiquette in how we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There has to be a demonstration of appreciation uh, for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And then, you know, uh, when, we, when we look at these conditions, so the first, again, is appreciation from God, thanking Him. Appreciating that he is in full control. And then I recognize the position of the Prophet after that. Right? So first comes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking him, appreciating what he's done. Then is the appreciation of the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala wa ali Muhammad. And then it's admitting our mistakes. Saying, look Allah, Ya Allah. I know I don't deserve this. I really know it. You know how awesome it is for somebody to admit that to God? Like, I know I don't deserve this. I really don't. But I really need this from you. Right? Man, I'm telling you, if we just know how to ask, things would change dramatically. Yeah, dramatically. In the way our du'as are accepted. And not just that, right? It's not, it's not about a give and take relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not. It's about building a rapport with God. Yeah? It's about building a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala A connection that will be unaltered Whether He gives me or He doesn't give me It won't matter at the end of the day What matters is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah? That's where we want to get to right? But it begins with this appreciation For what He is and what He has done from us As I said, these are the overarching etiquette right? Tomorrow we're going to be discussing in more detail what really prevents our du'as from being answered? And there's a really um, thought-provoking hadith, it's a lengthy hadith that we will dissect tomorrow. And then inshallah, a few weeks later, we're going to give maybe a 10-step program of what we can do to improve our communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. But like if you think about it, like this is the etiquette of du'a, and then you look at like Abu Talib alayhi salam and how he would communicate to God, right? And it would be the very similar approach. He would first thank God, he would praise God, and then he would recognize the maqam of the Prophet. And how could not then clouds form and give the answer to du'a of Abu Talib? Yeah? Because he knew the maqam of Rasulullah. He knew the maqam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's this iman of Abu Talib is why the Prophet wept profusely. Yeah? It wasn't just about one who sheltered him or one who looked after him. Right? It was one who was one of the first believers in him and who was thoroughly there in protection of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why we are told that the year in which he died was the same year in which Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam died. And the Prophet called it Amul Huzn, the year of sadness that befell him. Tonight I want to do the Masaib of the 28th of Rajab when we say that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam left Medina. You know, this was a monumentous event for Abba Abdullah. Medina was always very special to the Imams. That was where their grandfather was buried. That is where angels descended. That is where the Qur'an was revealed. And now that he had to leave that shelter and that comfort, it was very difficult. It is said that as the news was given by Imam alayhi salam that they were going to depart Medina, he gave the responsibilities for gathering the family and to gather the caravan to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. Yeah. Abbas was the standard bearer, but Abbas was the backbone of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yeah. It is said that after that responsibility was given, he went to the grave of Rasulullah. It is said he stood by the grave of Rasulullah and began to weep profusely. And then some say he fell asleep at the grave of Rasulullah and in his dreams he saw the Prophet approach him with rows and rows of angels behind him and he says to him, Ya Habibi, Ya Hussein, Ya Habibi, Ya Hussein, do not fret, for soon you will be coming to join us. But he says, O oh Hussein, let me tell you, 
that what saddens me about your arrival is the way that you will be arriving to us. He said, you will come with wounds throughout your body, with arrows having pierced your body. And he says, what saddens me the most, Hussein, is that you will come to me while you are thirsty, O Hussein. He just said, Imam al Hussein replies back and says, Ya Jadda, Ya Rasulullah, take me now, for I am ready to go. For he says, Wa inna laka fil jinani la darajatin lan tanaluha illa bi shahadati. He says, O oh Hussein, be patient. There is a maqam for you in Jannah that will not be fulfilled except by your shahada. The Imam alayhi salam leaves from the grave of Rasulullah. We see Abu al-Fadl Abbas preparing the caravan. The women and the children are put in their places of riding. Everyone is feeling secure, knowing, knowing what, that Abbas is there. <laughs> that Abbas will look after them. But ah, what a scene a few months later, my heart says, on the day after Ashura, when the women and the children were lined up with long chains and ropes, and they were forced to ride on unsaddled camels. Who was the Abbas on that day? Zainab was the Abbas on that day. The responsibility to make sure that all the women and children were on their eyes fell on the shoulders of Zainab. My heart asks me, I don't know. My heart asks me if Zainab looked towards the Furat and said, Oh Abbas! Oh Abbas, look what has happened. Just a few months ago, it was you who sheltered us. And now today, I have become Abbas. Yeah, I was saying.